Good morning once again. Uh, my name is Glenn, uh, one of the pastors here at the Rock Church, one of the elders. It's great to be with you. As most of you know who've been with us at the Rock Church for the last, well, it's been, uh, I think, 16 weeks in total, uh, we've been going through a series called The Good Life, Human Flourishing According to Jesus, based on his incredible sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And today, believe it or not, we, uh, we conclude that series. Woohoo! Actually, I'm quite sad. Um, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Janice and I were getting away this week a little bit. It was to be a time of prayer and rest and so forth. But it was also to be a time about praying about, okay, where next? And I just have to let you know that it's Sunday and I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> okay, so you'll be in prayer for me for next week, right? A couple of ideas. I just want to make sure the Holy Spirit is guiding us and leading us. So if you have your Bibles with you, open them, please, to Matthew uh, chapter 7. We will be concluding with verses 24 to 29 today of this amazing sermon. We, we actually went through the Gospel of Matthew, I think, in the second year. We started it of the rock when we planted it, and I think that took, with breaks, almost two and a half years, but it's a big Gospel. It was amazing. Um, so somebody said three. All right. <clears throat> Correct me if you want. Um, but anyway, it was, so I've been through the Sermon on the Mount preaching it wise twice. And uh, I just, again, I got to tell you that, you know, each time you come back to the Scripture, um, whether you're preaching it or reading it or whatever, it's remarkable how the Holy Spirit um, teaches you and shows you new things. And, and, and how, if you're, willing, if you're willing to let the Holy Spirit open your heart to what Christ is teaching, he can do a remarkable, a remarkable work in your life. And that's his goal through this whole sermon. So I'm going to read the final verses first, and then I'm going to pray one more time before we dive in. Jesus speaking. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. When Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not like their scribes. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, yeah, Lord, once again, what a wonderful day that you've blessed us with. What a wonderful day. It's hard to believe it's fall. (laughs) So, Lord, we thank you. Um, Lord, we thank you for so many things today. I thank you for uh, just the the surprise of seeing old friends again, young old friends again. What a blessing it is, Lord, to be part of a church family um, where we, uh, we remember each other. Most importantly, Lord, we remember you, which is why we're here today. And we thank you so much for how you have remembered us. And so, Lord Jesus, I thank you before we even conclude your words today for this sermon of yours. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for motivating and inspiring uh, both Matthew and Luke to record uh, this sermon. Matthew in in, in a succinct way, but Luke in in partial ways. And it's remarkable to see uh, the beautiful ways that they tie together, the way they parallel each other, as we'll see a little bit today. So again, Holy Spirit, thank you. Pray that you would do a work in our hearts today. I pray that you would conclude this in such a way that we would feel every one of us here today, watching online or watching this later, just really blessed by you. And I pray these things in your worthy name, Jesus. Amen. So again, uh, this week I just have a sermon title for you. It is kind of the point, so there's no need for three points. The sermon title is Two Builders, One Rock. Two Builders, One Rock. I think I've mentioned to you, many of you before in the past, about my grade 8 teacher. She had quite an impact on my life, which is why many, many years later, lots of years later, I still remember her. I was in a Catholic high school in Toronto. Her name was Mrs. Nevin. And she had this propensity, and I had her as a grade 8 teacher. And so my last year of grade school, 
And, and she had this propensity to like constantly be repeating the same things, but in different ways and going over the material and, and different ways. And, you know, we'd be sitting in the class after a little while ago, come on. and she would see us doing the yawning thing, right? Like, well, this is boring, you know, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And then she would say it. She would say it this way. Repetition, repetition is how you learn, Mr. Davies. And she'd look right at me. Didn't stop me from yawning. But I learned years later, she was totally right. I I believe that's exactly what Jesus has been doing in the Sermon on the Mount. It's what he does. I mean, you know that one of the favorite ways that Jesus teaches, and we'll see a bit of that today, is in parables. Uh, and, and, but if you, if you look at all the parables, he's, he's essentially telling us essentially the same thing, just in a different way. It's, it's incredible. It's, most preachers are supposed to try to emulate that, but it's hard. It's really hard because he's Jesus. But that's what he does. He's repeating things. And if you think about it, it began at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, didn't it? It began. His repetitiveness, the way that he went about this, was right from the very beginning, starting in verse 3 when he said, makarios, right? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then he repeated the word blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. Yes, there were different subjects. But there was a repetitiveness to the way he was teaching so that we would understand. And so we, we saw him do that and, and, and blessed. And we also know and we learned early on that, yeah, in our English language today, it was helpful. And yeah, we, we mostly study from, we don't just study from one translation of the Bible. We study from the original languages. And, and sometimes when you're doing that, uh, even a good translation like the one that we use generally at The Rock or others, they all use the word blessed for the most part. It's a good word. But we realize that at the end of the day, in our culture and in our understanding of that word, it could be taken the wrong way. And so we replaced that word with the word flourishing, as do many commentators on this particular book. Why? Because it is about that. It's about those who are already blessed, who are already in the kingdom of God, who have already been poor enough in spirit to recognize their sinful nature and now mourn over their sin, are meek, and all the rest of the character traits of the Beatitudes are the ones who are flourishing, are the ones who are living the good life. And so Jesus used that repetition right from the very beginning, and then he went on to talk about salt and light, right? And then comparing that, using comparison as a way of repetition to show us that, well, you could lose your saltiness, or there's also the opposite of light, which is darkness. And so the teaching was always about comparison, and it was repetitive in quite a way. And then we, of course, got to the key verse in the first chapter, well, verse chapter 5, which is verse 20, where Jesus laid down his thesis for this sermon when he said these words, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so it's from that point on that the comparisons flow one after the other in pairs, usually, By comparing the way of the Pharisees, the religious, as Joey, I think, said earlier, works-based guys, which is similar to the ways of the world, with the righteousness that you and I have if we are in Christ today, which we have given to us by the Lord and by the Holy Spirit. So he began by showing that anger in the human heart toward a brother or sister is, in God's economy and God's eyes, equivalent to murder. So there's a comparison for you. It's also a pair. He went on, of course, from there to talk about adultery and the lustful heart, which is really a lustful intent, which is the same thing in God's eyes. And unfortunately, that particular lustful heart often sometimes can lead to what he talked about next, which was divorce. That's a separation. That's a separation that's never intended. And the list goes on. Then after teaching on giving and prayer, really important teachings, Jesus moves to his conclusion where the comparisons arrive in very, very distinct pairs, right? I mean, first we saw a couple of weeks ago the narrow gate 
versus the wide road. Two roads that lead to two very distinct destinations. <laughs> and of course, that was followed by two trees that bear very different fruit and a warning to be in, on guard against false teachers to, find, to our final text today. And look, look at this. Today we're going to see, this is incredible, many more pairs. We're going to see two builders. We're going to see two foundations. And once again, two very, very different destinations. Jesus begins with these words in verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So this is immediately reminiscent in a little bit. This won't be on screen, but verse 21, it's kind of reminiscent to uh, what he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. So there's a great separation there, right? And comparison to the ones who do not do the will of the Father, do not listen to what he has to say, and their destination versus the one, the few, who do. And it's about the will of my Father. It's the one who does the will of the Father, who enters the kingdom of heaven. And now in verse 24, he makes it much clearer by saying this. It's the one who hears and yes, does, we'll get to it, what he hears. In his par parallel passage, I love, we went through the Gospel of Luke a while ago, and I want to take you to a couple of verses there. He records it this way. And again, just remember before we put the verses on screen, Dr. Luke's not like Matthew. Right? He, he did not walk with Jesus. He did not, as far as we know, see Jesus crucified, dead, buried, and risen. He was like a journalist and went and talked to all of the others and got a bunch of details and filled in the blanks for his good friend Theophilus so that the story would be, in Luke's words, more complete, per se. He says this about this event. He starts off with, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? And then, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. And then Luke goes into what Matthew does in the conclusion here. And so I, I love the way actually Luke records the fact that first it's about coming and seeing. It, it first, it's, that's the first step in most people's lives is like, hey, come to church. <laughs> come, come hear the gospel. Come, come here and see what Jesus is like. W how? Well, we're going to talk about him. We're going to sing to him. But, we're, but you're also going to see those who are his living that way, hopefully. So Come right? But then he also moves it to not only do, do they first come, then they hear his words and finally does them who enters the kingdom of heaven. Luke then goes on to tell us what the person who comes here and does look like. And once again, he tells this parable by comparing two men, two builders, just like Matthew does. So back to Matthew in verse 24. I'll read it one more time and we'll put it on screen again. Everyone then, Jesus speaking, who hears these words of mine and does them will be a wise man who built his house on the rock. So first, really important point. He's not talking about what comes out of his mouth next. <laughs> oh, that too. He's talking about the whole sermon. He's talking about the whole sermon because this is his conclusion, the third part of his conclusion. It's a wrap-up. So first, Jesus identifies this man or woman as, this is important, wise this person has wisdom. Many commentators whom I've read, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit through the series, uh, uh, suggest that this, this sermon, and again, because of you know, the way the fact that Jesus looked out at the crowd and he saw the Jewish tradition, uh, philosophical uh, leaders represented there, but also the Greco-Roman philosophical uh, members of that society present. And so they describe it as wisdom literature almost on par, per se, with like Proverbs. And, and, and I have to agree with them to a certain point that it's, it's similar to that. And of course, we see it here in the, in, in the use of the idea that one needs to be wise. One needs to be wise. So Jesus is talking about wisdom. So first, the wise choice, as we've seen before, is the narrow gate, right? That, Jesus has already told us, is the wise choice. Choose the narrow gate. 
and not the wide road. And here, the wise choice is to build your house, a metaphor for your life, on the rock. I would have loved to fill in their church, but no, just kidding. On the rock. And I'm sure you know who he is. And so that's first and foremost. The wisdom then that we must possess is to see the good life as one that requires building. Okay, so it's, it's not like you come to Christ, and the minute you come to Christ, you place your faith, and you know that you have the Holy Spirit, that you're born again, your house is built. That's a delusion. I just thought I'd let you know. It's about being built. It still needs building. But there's a start, and that's part of what he's getting at here today. It's that kind of life that can only be built, again, on the rock. Repetition? There's going to be more of it (laughs) before we conclude today. And if it is built on the rock, listen what Jesus says. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. Pause there. Can I just make this point very simple? Because we're going to go into a few other things here which are maybe more important. It's it's a process in life. There's rain. Do you ever notice that in Squamish? It rains, right? It can be a burden. But, but then it can also build into floods if it won't stop raining. Right? And, and then, of course, winds can blow. So there, there's, it, this is an increase. This is an escalation that is happening here that Jesus is pointing out. The winds blew and beat on that house, like literally beat on that house. House is a metaphor for your life and my life. Good news. The good news is it did not fall. This house that Jesus is describing, the house of a wise man or woman, does not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. So what we have here is a parable, really, isn't it? This is a parable that Jesus is giving to us. Jesus used them often, as we know, to teach truth in simple but very, very clear ways. The really good news for this wise man who built his or her life on this rock, his house, her house, survives. That's the good news. But hang on, that person still experienced, as we see, still experienced rain, floods, fierce winds, the beating on their house. And yet, yes again, it stood strong. And why? In this parable, it's because it had a firm foundation. And that's really the key. Luke records it with a few more details in chapter 6, verse 48. He says, when he goes into it, he says, he is like a man building a house, look at this, who dug deep. (laughs) Dug really, really deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well. So the lesson here is the wise person understands that the good life, a life of flourishing, depends on depth. It depends on depth. In the case of a house, if you want that house to survive storms, you will need to take the time to dig maybe down to even bedrock so that you can pour the concrete, the foundation, right on the bedrock. You need to get sometimes that deep to lay a strong foundation. You know what? That costs time and money. Anybody? (laughs) That actually costs a lot of time and money. In the Christian life, which I remind you is the good life, it requires a depth of faith and character to live and, frankly, survive the Christian life. Listen, like we saw a few weeks ago, there are people who are going to stand before Christ who thought they did that, who thought they were his disciples, and he's going to reject them. They were wrong. They were not wise in this life. And so... 
as we look at this, as I said, it requires a depth of faith and character to survive. On the other hand, another way to live your life as a man or woman whom Jesus calls foolish, you Greek fans will either like or not like this word because it's not politically correct today. The Greek word is moros, where we actually get the word moron. That's how foolish Jesus deems this person. Clearly the opposite of wise when he says this, and everyone, this is very inclusive, who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house. Same as the other person. And it fell. That house fell. And great was the fall of it. So, so what's the key here? What's the key sign that this man or woman is foolish? Well, they're similar. They're those who, who came and saw. They're those who heard the word. They're those who heard about Christ, heard about his offer of salvation and, and forgiveness of sin. but did not follow through. This this is part of not doing what he tells us to do, which is to repent and ask for forgiveness. So instead, they assume they can live their lives however they choose. They believe that they are more capable of building a life for themselves, the life they want for themselves, all on their own. In this parable, Jesus implies that what's foolish about them is not just that they will not listen to him, but quite frankly, that they have no foundation. That's the foolish part. That they just want to, and I've seen this in my own life and in the lives of others, they just want to get rich quick, right? Or or, or cut corners to get their house, their life built so that they can just lay back and eat, drink, and be merry and live this life to its fullest. And if it requires cutting corners and not laying a foundation, fine. Sadly, for those who attempt to build a life without a firm foundation, Jesus, again, is really, really clear, isn't he? When the storms come, and they will, the life they've built because of the way they've built it will not survive the storms. Quite the parable. My father uh, was a bricklayer by trade. I grew up in a, <laughs> what at the time was a North Toronto uh, working class neighborhood. My parents bought our house in North Toronto for $14,000. They could barely afford the mortgage. <laughs> it's a while ago, right? And uh, dad was a bricklayer, and then he worked really, really hard, and he moved up into the position of general manager in a uh, general con- contracting company in Toronto. And he did really, really well until 25 years in, the owners of the company sold the company. The new guys who came in thought my dad was too old for the job, and they fired him. Well, they let him go. They gave him a clock radio for 25 years of service and said, thanks for coming, Tom. Well, dad was a bit discouraged, to say the least. And he kept looking and looking for work. It took a while, uh, actually a couple of years, and we were quite worried about my father. Um, But anyway, he ended up getting a job with the city of Toronto as a a beginner in the city uh, building department and as a building inspector. And and my dad is a hardworking man. And after six or seven years, they actually promoted him to one of the chief inspector roles in the city of Toronto. His claim to fame, and, and he loved it. He passed away 14 or 15 years ago now, but he was the lead building inspector on the Sky Dome where the Blue Jays play. That was my dad's favorite team. And, and so anyway, well, the reason why I tell you that is my dad, my dad was a man of the book. I'm not talking about the Bible. <laughs> I'm talking about the building code. My dad was like, it was incredible the way he, and actually, when he was a building inspector, he had to go to court several times, and I don't know if I should be saying, well, he's, he's passed, so it's not. He would get threats from people who were kind of part of some illegal organization I won't get into, uh, that if you don't uh, pass our building and our development, uh, hey, something might happen to you. 
my dad was a man of the book, right? He used to come to visits to British Columbia, and we'd be driving around in Langley or wherever we lived at the time, and he would see these developments of new homes and stuff like that. And, and it was like, every once in a while, I'd, just, I'd see him shaking his head, and I knew it was coming. Because my dad would just say, he goes, I would never pass code in Ontario. <laughs> you know, at first I thought, I thought, you know what, my dad's just very prideful. And, uh, but no, he had a very keen eye. He could tell by looking at a house that just had the Tyvek on it whether or not it was built well. He could tell. Friends, listen, if, if you and I are honest, we can see that in our own lives too, right? But also in the lives of those we love. We can pick up on that. And so why do you think Jesus is teaching this parable? Why? I mean, why would he be teaching this if not just to warn each of us to come hear and do the things that he tells us to do, which he is, to build our lives on the rock, which is him and his word. If not also, listen, to disciple and love one another well. I have to believe that this is also a key aspect of the lesson that he has for his, us here. Why? Why? Because, friends, listen, as he's been concluding throughout this whole sermon, he cares about your eternal soul. And he cares about the eternal soul of everyone who hears him. That's why he's going to this trouble. And so listen, building codes are in place for a good reason. They're in place for a good reason. Why? So that we will build houses that will be safe and healthy. Many of you don't know this, but back in the day when we first bought this building and we went to go renovate it, um, we had a couple of contractors helping us. One was uh, our dear brother, the late Rob Pelland. And after we cracked up the old concrete that you're sitting on or standing on here today and and pulled it all up, Rob was walking around the building going, "Uh uh-oh. And we were like, what? (laughs) Because again, I know my dad's a building code guy. And if dad came out and saw it, anyway. And so he said, "Um, Glenn, the, the, the building has been built on a pad. There's no foundation beneath the walls. And he knew that the job had to be stopped. And I was like, please don't do that. Because <laughs> I knew it was going to cost me. So anyway, he calls up the building inspector. The building, the building inspector comes and goes, yeah, that's a big problem. And the building inspector essentially said this. Well, he did say this. You have two choices. Uh, tear down the building, lay a foundation, and start over. <laughs> to which I'm going, Lord... <laughs> And or find a solution. Well, the guys did. They found a great solution, which the building inspector passed. And so now we have uh, 10 feet sections underneath the walls of our building that go down four feet that are concrete with rebar. And then we have three foot gaps. And then we have another one all the way around the building. Let me, let me put it this way. That cost a lot of money. <laughs> but it had to be done. There's fifty, sixty thousand dollars of steel at the front of this building. If you look up at the beams here, there's one in the middle, and then there's three more, two more on one side and one on the other, and big bolts going through it. We had to put that in there to make it seismically approved. And I like to joke to people, and that's because if we ever do have a combination of, of a tsunami and an earthquake here in downtown Squamish, I've said to people, the only building, at least the front of it that'll be standing, will be this building. <laughs> but it's the code. And it's good, but it costs. It costs. So friends, as I said, building codes are in place so that your home, your property, to the best of the ability of the code anyway, will be safe and will survive storms. Um, In life, we have something much better. We have the book the book, the words of Christ, the word of God to guide us how to build a life. Amen? That's what he's getting at here. And it's so that we can survive the storm. So let's qu- quickly, I want to recap before we get to our conclusion and you're going, amen. So let's recap. What we've got here is this. In this parable, we have two men who are both builders. Sometime after that, they, they've, they've done building their homes. Both of those ho- their houses are struck by a storm. You'll notice I'm repeating this, but it's important. In Luke's gospel, he records that the same story, and he calls it a flood. 
Those are the similarities, but there are also some big differences as well. Um, the first man, we, we are told, dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. The second man uh, didn't bother doing that with all, just maybe laid a concrete pad and started building, right? And up they go. These homes, they go up. They go up both, both at the same time. You would appear based on this parable. So the way that they build their homes was very different, one with a foundation, one without. And so that's the first key difference. The result was they were quite different, though, weren't they? The man who built his house with a foundation built on the rock or on bedrock. His house remained standing through the storm, and the storm could not shake it. And why? Because the Scripture tells us it was well built. It was strong. It could withstand these things. Second man's? Not so much. The flood came, and we read, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Total destruction. So again, we have a very simple story, easy to understand. Jesus began this story by saying it's an illustration of the life of the disciple who has come, heard, and is also doing what Jesus has taught him or her to do. The houses are a metaphor for our lives. The first man sets out to build a life that has a firm foundation. It takes time. It costs time. It takes effort, but it's worth it. There's another similarity that isn't quite that obvious. The picture Jesus wants us to see is that on the surface, on the surface, he wants us to see this. If you saw these homes being built, but especially at completion, they'd look exactly the same. They'd be identical. They'd be in a development where every cookie cutter, but they would look pretty much identical and the same. Whether it's the roof, the walls, the color of paint, the windows, everything except one thing. You know what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. The thing that you cannot see. The foundation. And that's what makes all the difference. There's also one more similarity that is also not obvious. Both of these men in the parable had a choice. They both had a choice. Those of you who are fans of free will, here you go. Both of them had a choice. Build with a foundation or not. And frankly, the truth is, many of us do the same thing with many decisions we make in our lives. Right? We do. We don't count the cost. In fact, it's usually a reason why (laughs) we cut corners, isn't it? We we look at the cost and go, oh, I don't want to do that. But you're telling me we need to like either tear down or, oh, I don't want to do that. And so the question is, why did the one man choose to build a foundation on the rock? Well, simply this. He comes to hear Christ. He, He hears him. He or she literally does hear him. Here's the call on their lives. A choice is made, a decision is made. And that choice is, I need to follow him. And I need to build my life on what he tells me to do. Why? Because he loves me. He loves me so much. So friends, today, I, I, I want to I implore you that you, you can start or even restart building your life that way today. It might require renovations or, listen, it could require a teardown. We actually had it costed out. It was close. Ooh. But in the end, it will be worth it. Storms are coming in your life, friends, if they haven't already right? And in mind, they're inescapable. No one can escape. Now listen, as we hear Jesus' final words today of this wonderful sermon, it's not lost on me, and I'm sure not on you, that we've had some very, very literal examples of storms very recently in North America, haven't we? Thankfully, fortunately, not in our own backyard. But I have family and friends in Cape Breton and on the east coast of Canada. And what happened with Fiona and then Ian in Florida, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the news. I'm sure you've seen what happens. One thing should be very clear from those disasters. We as human beings have no defense against those kind of storms. Amen? We just don't. 
have any defense against those kind of storms, these physical storms. They prove that we are powerless against them. It's humbling. So finally, there is one last similarity between not just these two men, but between all of us here today. One day, you and I are going to face the greatest storm of our lives. Death. That's a great storm. Anyone who's walked through someone who's died knows that. And I'm sure you're aware of that. So this parable warns us that a life built on anything but the rock who is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you and for me will not stand the ultimate storm, let alone the storms of this life. All of his teachings about two ways and two paths are Jesus showing, as I've said already, his deep love, his deep concern for your eternal soul. Yes, he wants you and I to live the good life today. But again, Christian, let's be clear. The good life that we can and have open to us to live today is not the good life that the world is searching searching after, amen? It's not the same at all, but it's still the good life. It's how it ends that is incredibly important. His desire is, listen, that you and I will be saved from the greatest storm ever. That's his desire. Matthew ends the gospel with these words, or the sermon, I should say. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd were astonished as a teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So that's it, right? Sermon's over? (laughs) Some of you are going, yes, please, Glenn. Our chapter breaks are not in the original manuscripts. But this is Matthew wrapping it up. And and he's telling us that one of the things that happens very clearly is the crowd deemed that Jesus was wise, wiser than their scribes, wiser probably than anyone they'd ever heard. Any philosopher, any person who did a TED Talk, Jesus had authority like none other because he was wise. I want to show you the next three verses because I believe these are the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 8 begins with, when he came down from the mountain. Okay, so you remember, chapter, seven, chapter 5 begins, and he went up a mountain. So I'm suggesting this is the bookend. This is the real, literal bookend. Great crowds followed him. Great crowds followed him up. Great crowds followed him down. And behold, this is incredible, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, if it is your will. And then he said, you can make me clean. Friends, that's a statement of faith. That's that's not just a wish. That's a statement of faith. And then we read, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be clean. And immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. We don't have time this morning. I can go into it with you in further detail another time, but essentially, the takeaway is this. This man represented a very, very important turning point in the ministry of Jesus. Quite frankly, I believe in history. Jesus comes down after preaching the sermon of the kingdom, of righteousness. And he is approached by a man who, listen, COVID is one thing. Leprosy, especially in that day where there is zero cure. And listen, a mask would not help you. This man was supposed to approach Jesus, and while he was approaching Jesus, be yelling out so that everyone would hear, including Jesus, unclean, unclean, and announcing that an unclean person was coming into your presence. Not not just in their minds because this person had this terrible disease. Because in that day, in some ways in even our culture today, people believe this man had leprosy. Because he was a great, 
great sinner. Not necessarily true. And so here's the paradigm shift. I want you to leave. I want to leave with you this morning because it, 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 it's historical. This happened on this day. As a result of this sermon, Jesus comes down and says, uh-uh. I'm going to show you the difference. It used to be, and I was going to have a, 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 an example up here. I'll use this stand. It used to be the idea was if I go and touch something that's unclean, I'm made unclean. If I go and hang out with a sinner, I am seen as unclean in the eyes of God. And Jesus is flipping that paradigm, and he's saying, (laughs) no. On that day, as he descended the mountain, Jesus said, here's the way it's going to be from now on. When I touch someone, they are immediately healed, and they are immediately made clean. For how long? Forever. So friends, I I just want to encourage you that as you digest this sermon over the days and weeks ahead, that we just remember that there's nothing so unclean out there that Jesus can't clean them, right? And yet, what's the remarkable thing about what he's asking you and I to do? Is to go. To be what? To be his hands and his feet. to speak into their lives, teach them everything that we know about Christ and about the gospel so that he can touch them and heal them for eternity. Amen? Let's pray.